This is a super-sized ant farm, built for one purpose. To unlock the secrets of one of nature's most complicated societies, the ant colony. The scientists who will lead this ambitious project are Dr. George McGavin and Professor Adam Hart. Leafcutters are some of the most highly organised animals on the planet. They march through the jungle, stripping leaves from plants and trees, taking them back to their massive underground nests. And that's exactly what's been recreated here. These chambers and tunnels have been constructed to mimic a real-life nest, one that we can see inside. It's very hard to observe the behaviour of these ants in the field because it's very hot and humid and dark. So being able to control that and being able to film every minute aspect of what they're up to is, is a unique insight into their world. The first thing the team are going to do is open up one of these nest boxes and discover why they're so vital to the life of the colony. This is a first glimpse into the hidden world of the ant nest. In the wild, this would be an underground chamber excavated by the ants themselves. And inside here is something crucial to the colony. This grey material here is, is fungus, in fact, which they're farming inside their nests. And they're using those leaves that they cut to help them grow this fungus. Leafcutter ants, despite their name, don't eat leaves. They bring them into the nest as a food supply for this fungus. And it's the fungus that they eat. These ants are farmers, and the fungus is their crop. And hidden inside these chambers is something else vital to the colony. These white, translucent shapes you can see are the brood. That's the eggs, larvae and pupae reared deep within the fungus. So the nest boxes not only contain a food supply, but also the young of the ant colony. Right now, George and Adam are going to open up this box and get a closer look at the ants. So let me just get a bit out. I'll try and avoid getting a big soldier. Try and avoid a soldier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't nice. like that very much. The soldiers, as their name suggests, are ants who protect the nest. They're big and they bite. I haven't managed to avoid a soldier. But... Yeah, oh, thanks. Oh, it just bit me. Thank you. There There's you a go. big one there. Yep, there's a big one. One of them you. has just bitten my hand. Ah! <gasps> wow. There is a ma There's a massive soldier ooh, who has just found a crease in my skin. Yeah. But the soldiers are just one kind of ant in the nest. It's teeming with different sizes of ant. In the insect world, this is called a caste system, meaning there are a number of different body types within a single species. We've already seen the powerful bite of one of these, a soldier. That head isn't filled with a large brain, rather a massive set of muscles to power a huge pair of jaws, strong enough to cut through leather. Going down the size scale, this smaller ant is called a media worker. These are the ants that collect and bring leaves back to the nest. For this reason, they're also known as foragers. The smallest ants in the colony are called the minima, and these are the most numerous cast of all. These aren't young ants who will grow bigger, they are fully grown adults. But there are quite a lot of roles within the colony that very small ants can do. They might be tending the fungus, they might be cleaning the queen, they might be feeding the young. And hidden in one of these boxes is perhaps the most important ant of all, the queen. 
she's the only ant who reproduces. So if she dies, the entire colony will die with her. To get their ant project up and running, the team needed a thriving colony from the wild, complete with a healthy queen. And Adam was given the difficult task of tracking one down. This is the island of Trinidad, just off the coast of Venezuela. Adam is on his way to a colony of leafcutter ants that sounds perfect for the project. Leafcutters are native here and they're considered a serious pest because they attack the fruit trees. The colony Adam's going to see was about to be destroyed by a farmer. But digging up a nest of one million ants and finding the queen won't be easy. Um, but we're going to have to do it almost surgically when we begin because we really need to make sure that we don't kill that queen. But if we don't have the queen intact, then we're stuck. Waiting at the nest site is Andy Stevenson. All right, Andy. Adam. How's it going? Right. Good to see you. This is the nest. Digging up like? ants is Andy's speciality. He provides leafcutter colonies to zoos, museums and universities across the world. With the aid of local expertise, the dig begins. Let's start taking about a foot at a time. We'll start taking a slice and we'll work our way back. From here, Adam and the team will push back into the nest, searching for the queen. What they see is a maze of chambers connected by a system of tunnels. This natural architecture inspired the construction of the giant ant nest for the project, with glass boxes and tubes replacing the chambers and tunnels. By mimicking a real-world design, the scientists hope to encourage the ants to behave as they do in the wild. And it's not just ants that need to be rescued from this nest, but also the fungus. Without it, the ants will quickly die. At the end of day one, they've recovered thousands of ants and a large quantity of fungus but they've still to recover the most vital ant of all. No, she's not here. The queen. Failure to find her means failure of the entire project. Day two, and the hunt for the queen continues. They're looking for something quite distinctive. The queen is huge compared to the other ants, and she'll be covered in smaller ants who tend her. There's something really smart here. Oh, yeah. OK. Yeah, yeah. This could be what they're looking this, for. This looks very promising. So this could be the queen in the middle. I think we're in here. Yes, there she is, oh, yeah. the queen. Excellent. One ant in nice. two million, we found her. Through tons of earth, the team has found the most important ant of all. <laughs> it's a great relief, <laughs> and it means the project can go ahead. So now, there's a thriving colony in the giant ant farm, and straight away, the ants get to work. They're demolishing every plant they're given. And all those leaves are being used to grow their crop of fungus. It's like a production line that turns leaves into fungus, with each ant playing a crucial role. And the first job is the leaf cutting itself. This method is incredibly powerful, 
enabling the ant to slice through even the toughest of leaves. Here, that same blade-like technique is being used on a very thick banana leaf. They're anchoring themselves with their, their back feet, their back legs. So when they go around with this guillotine, they're describing an arc of a circle, and the bigger the ant, the bigger the arc. Absolutely. So you end up with a really nice mechanism to make sure that bigger ants carry bigger loads. But this is just the beginning of the ant's journey. The leaf has to be carried all the way back to the nest. First, leaf fragments are carried in a marching column across the ropes, over the foraging table and up the bridge. When they reach the top, the ants head down into the nest, making their way through the tubes towards the fungus. There, smaller and smaller ants chop up the fragments until it's mashed into a kind of plant mulch. The tiniest ants of all then insert this mulch into the growing fungus. And there's nothing haphazard about this process. This structure is carefully built by the ants. The pattern of ridges and hollows allows them to fit more fungus into a confined space. And the hollows provide a safe place to nurture the brood. The whole process is like a massive production line. By working together, the ants are able to achieve great things feats of organisation that would be impossible if they were just acting as a bunch of individuals. But this remarkable ability to cooperate isn't unique to the leafcutters. Some ants take the idea of cooperation to a whole new level. Floating on the Amazon River is a wonder of the animal world. It may look like a tangle of weeds, but up close, it's a seething mass of ants. This is Solenopsis invicta, the fire ant. To survive the regular floods of the Amazon, an entire colony can join together as one large raft, built from their own bodies. They can survive like this for months, waiting for dry land. So how do the fire ants do it? Here at the Georgia Institute of Technology in the United States, scientist Nathan Mlott has studied this amazing ability. One of the big questions people ask is, you know, what happens to the ants on the bottom? Do they drown? And the answer is no. When you push it under the water, they essentially remain dry. They retain a pocket of air um, kind of around their bodies. It's almost encapsulating them inside an air pocket so they can still breathe. Each ant is naturally water repellent. Droplets simply slide off them as if they're covered in wax. And when thousands of ants combine, the result is a raft that is virtually unsinkable. When you do push them under the water, they pull themselves even tighter together so that when they're subjected to the high pressures underneath the water, it still keeps the water out. Magnified hundreds of times, the secrets of the fire ant raft are revealed. The mandibles are used to grab hold of a nestmate's leg. At the end of each leg is an adhesive pad and a claw. This, like a sticky grappling hook, allows them to form further flexible connections with any nearby nestmate. 
This ability allows the fire ants to survive the worst floods of the Amazon. Their talent for cooperation has made them an engineering marvel of the natural world. Working together for the good of the colony is a trait shared by all ants, and this is clearly seen with the leafcutters here in the giant ant farm. Cooperation allows them to live in nests that can contain millions of individuals. But living in such big numbers brings with it the kind of challenges we humans face in our towns and cities. All that leaf processing produces a huge amount of waste. So George is going to investigate how the leaf cutters deal with their trash burden. Now, what we've got here is a waste dump that they've made actually in the trough that surrounds the whole colony. And that's a water-filled trough which is designed to keep the ants in. But what's happened is the, the ants have built a, a, a waste dump and because it's wet and the bacteria are building up in here, the smell of decaying ants and fungus is absolutely, it's overpowering, it's disgusting. The dump is usually placed at the bottom of the nest and the workers turn over the waste to speed up the breakdown of harmful substances. But the ants aren't just dumping their rubbish down here, they're also disposing of dead bodies. Over on this side is the graveyard. Now, th this is actually very interesting. And that, in my hand, is just the dead remains of literally hundreds and hundreds of ants of all castes. There's small workers, large workers, soldiers. And so when the ants have no longer any function and when they die, they're simply taken out and dumped. Living so closely together and in such high numbers means that a disease could quickly spread throughout the colony. To reduce this risk, the ants must maintain a clean environment. So anything that can rot, like dead bodies or waste plant matter, is removed from the nest. The dump and the graveyard show just how sophisticated the ant colony is. The level of organisation seems almost human. We even use the language of our own social structures to describe ant society. Workers, soldiers, the queen. But is ant society really organised in this kind of hierarchy? Is the queen in charge? It's not possible to see the queen inside this colony because she's hidden deep in one of the nest chambers. But the team are able to take a look at a queen from a similar leafcutter colony. So what we have here, George, is when I dug out the ground in Trinidad, um, there's the queen. I've never seen a queen before yeah. like that. She's yeah. an impressive creature. She's impressive in her own right, but when you see her next to the smaller ants around, it really gives you an idea of just how big she is. This is the queen's enormous body protruding from the fungus, with smaller ants tending her. Inside her large abdomen are the ovaries that allow her to lay up to 30,000 eggs a day. I just want to just touch her. <gasps> yeah. She's just, she's beautiful. This ant colony will only ever have one queen in residence. But once a year, it will produce new queens who will leave the nest to start new colonies. This is the only time the colony will produce males. And these males have one single purpose, to mate. Leafcutters have never been observed mating in the wild but we can see how much of a large-scale operation this is with a different species, the wood ant. In late summer, the colony produces hundreds of new queens and males. 
These ants have wings, and they fly from the nest en masse to find a mate. This event is called a nuptial flight. After this, the queen will never mate again, and the males simply die. Inside this colony right now, there are no males at all. It's a staggering thought that every single ant here is female. And they're all sisters. So the ants live in a very, very different world to our own. Only the queen reproduces, and that's her only job. Everything else is done by the workers, even raising the brood from egg to adult. This results in a number of different generations of ant, all working together for the good of the colony. And these attributes put these ants in a special category, the eusocial or truly social insects. They're phenomenally successful. They make up only about 2% of all insect species, but account for most of the insect biomass on the planet. The major groups of eusocial insects are ants, termites, wasps, and bees. Together, these insects outnumber all the others on Earth combined. Being eusocial is one of the most important evolutionary developments in the animal kingdom. It's such a significant step that scientists are trying to discover when it first occurred and what it is about living cooperatively that gives these insects such an advantage. Dr. David Grimaldi is the curator of fossil insects at the American Museum of Natural History. He spent 25 years studying specimens of ants and other insects millions of years old. This sample is from the Cretaceous era. We know that these early ants were wandering around the time of dinosaurs. The dinosaurs, of course, died out, but the ants went on to become astonishingly uh, abundant. The sap of ancient trees trapped them as they foraged and then hardened into amber, preserving them for millions of years. Now, these remarkable specimens are helping scientists discover more about the origins of eusocial insects. So when we look at this giant ant farm, we're also seeing an ancient society, millions of years older than our own. One which has evolved to rival ours in its complexity. One of the, the things that you have to ask yourself when you see such a, an organised collective enterprise is, is how do they organise themselves? Who decides? Who decides what to do? Who decides where to go? But this insect civilization operates without a leader. Not even the queen is in charge. So how do the ants manage such feats of organisation? To help answer that question, Professor Adam Hart has devised an experiment. I set the ants a problem. I've given them a Y-shaped trail, and at one end of that Y is food, and at the other end is nothing. And I've connected that trail up to the main trail, so they're pouring down out of the nest, coming down onto this trail, and they're being faced with a choice. Do they go left or do they go right? The ants have a clear 50-50 choice between right and left. But after just 20 minutes, virtually all of them are heading down the path that leads to the food. So how do they know where to go? At this distance, they can't see the food. Leafcutter's eyesight isn't good enough. Instead, it's all down to the ingenious way the ants share information with each other 
using their acute sense of smell. The ants moving down here are laying behind them a chemical pheromone trail that marks the way for other ants. They can detect tiny amounts of these pheromones using their antennae. When an ant goes out foraging, she leaves a pheromone trail on the ground behind her that her sisters are able to follow. If she finds food, she will then lay down even more pheromone on her way back to the nest, making the original trail even stronger. If she doesn't find food, she won't lay any more pheromone and the trail simply evaporates away. The stronger the pheromone trail, the more likely an ant is to follow it and in turn add her own pheromone to the root. So that when ants come to that fork and they have to make a decision, they follow the trailhead that's got the most amount of pheromone in, so they're much more likely to go right than they are to go left. And that means these ants can organise themselves. The queen's not in the colony going, turn right, turn left, you know, take the third exit. They follow the trail pheromone to the food. So each individual ant is dealing with simple signals, simple rules. But collectively, this system achieves complex results. It enables the colony to find new food sources, exploit them efficiently, and react swiftly when they are depleted. But pheromones aren't the only way leafcutters communicate. They're constantly exchanging information, and with the right technology, it's possible for the team to listen in. It's a very small noise, and it's quite high frequency, but if we just push that onto there. To human ears, the ant's world seems silent. But amplified by the microphone, the leaf comes alive with noise. And there's one particular sound George and Adam are listening for. In amongst the sounds of leaves being cut and ant footsteps is a high-pitched chirp. This is stridulation, a sound the ants make by rubbing two sections of their abdomen together. So they're making this, this sound, but it's part of a, a group of sounds that they make, these stridulation sounds. That little chirruping noise is a recruitment signal. The more nutritious a leaf is, the more the ant makes this noise, sending a cascade of vibrations through the plant. And this draws other ants to the tastiest parts of the plant. So the ants will always take the best leaves first. But there's more to stridulation than simply leaf cutting. It can make the difference between life and death. As they build their vast underground nests, ants, just like human miners, face an ever-present risk. A roof collapse could bury them alive. To discover how they respond, Adam and George are going to simulate this catastrophe. This is a plate microphone, so this is recording directly from what's on the surface. You Just, put an ant on and I'll... I'll yeah, uh, I'll drop an... I'll, I'll wrangle the ant, you get some earth on there. Ready? Yeah. There we go. Buried live. So this is going to be the sound of ant fear. This is an ant that's been trapped underneath the soil and it's, it's calling its nestmates in. There's a bit of hiss there, but you can hear... Yeah. And that's the noise they're making by moving that abdomen backwards and forwards, that's scraping That's very it obvious, isn't it? Yeah. It's a very clear signal that causes a very specific behaviour. Come over here, dig me out. With only a loose covering of soil, this ant isn't in any real danger. She digs her way toward the surface, the noise of panic stops, and she emerges. There we go. She's out. Free.
In this colony, the ants communicate using signals like pheromones and stridulation. And these signals form the basis of a simple set of rules that are followed by individual ants. There is no central command and control. When you observe an ant colony, it, it seems that, that they're able to do pretty amazing things. But actually all you need to do is have a few simple rules which are controlled by, by pheromones, by odours or sounds. And if all the ants collectively follow the same rules, they're able to achieve what seems to be pretty complex things. This is collective swarm intelligence and it underpins the entire leaf-cutting operation of this ant colony. In the wild, the simple rule system leads to some equally amazing behaviours. Driver ants create imposing trails guarded by huge soldiers to ensure the safe passage of the brood from one place to another. The Asian weaver ants build intricate nests using their brood as glue guns. This is an insect using a tool. All of these behaviours, wonders of the natural world, owe their existence to simple rules, followed by all colony members in the same way over and over again. So far, with the help of the giant ant farm, the scientists have been able to see close up the amazing work of the leaf cutters. But there's one type of ant whose behaviour remains more mysterious than any other. The soldiers. They're rarely seen out on the foraging trails. So what are they doing? To find out, the team have attached radio tracking devices to individual soldiers, allowing them to follow these ants 24 hours a day. They've placed radio receivers all over the nest and tracked each individual ant as it moved through the tubes and chambers. This experiment should provide new insights into the role of the soldiers within the colony. And Adam has been analysing the results. Well, what's really interesting is that individual soldiers are behaving in quite a strange way. Um, they're patrolling. So one, for example, goes from this box to this box to this box, back again, back again, over about 20 hours. We have had uh, others doing exactly the same sort of oscillatory behaviour between boxes. So almost as if each of the soldiers has a, has a sector of the nest that they, they patrol. The results show the soldiers as a highly organised security force patrolling the fungus gardens. Some spend their entire time moving between just two nest boxes, while others have much larger precincts. Many patrols are concentrated around this area here, with so much extra security, the team think this could be where the queen is. When viewed all together, the patrols appear to be an organised security network designed to protect the prized assets of the colony, the fungus, the brood and the queen. Like all the other ants in the colony, the soldiers are following a set of simple rules that lead to complex collective behaviour. The ants, working together, form a sophisticated society operating highly efficient systems, systems that we can learn from. We can learn from the way that ants do certain tasks, how ants do certain processes, and we can use those processes and those methods to inspire better solutions for some of the problems that we face, particularly, for example, in big industry or in distribution or in some of the networking and electrical sort of problems that we have.
Here in the Texan heat, a very cold industry is at work. Charles Harper is a director at Air Liquide, a company that supplies tanker loads of compressed gas to thousands of customers, from hospitals to oil refineries. It might seem crazy, but he turned to ants for help with a fiendishly difficult business problem. Here we monitor the supply of and the production of all of our gases and our liquids in the United States. We have 100 plants and about 10,000 customer sites today. So on a, any given day, we have to know who needs a delivery and where to source the liquid from. The company spends millions of dollars on gasoline every year. So to keep fuel bills down, they have to find the shortest delivery routes between all of their customers. And this challenge has a name, the traveling salesman problem. The task is to find the shortest route between a number of cities, visiting each only once before returning to the starting point. With five cities, there are only 12 possible delivery routes. But as more destinations are added, the number of potential routes skyrockets. A trip with just 15 cities has over 40 billion possible routes. With so many customer sites to deliver to, Air Liquide faces a delivery problem that has trillions of possible solutions. Inside this computer, there is a program based on ant behavior. It's called an ACO, or Ant Colony Optimization. The direct analogy would be an ant is equivalent to one of our trucks and the ants going in and obtaining food, which would be one of our customer locations. In, in the reverse, if we're delivering something, the ant would bring something back. The program sends out digital versions of ants to investigate potential routes. Just like real life leaf cutters, the digital ants lay virtual pheromones as they go. Quicker routes become reinforced with pheromone as more and more ants begin to follow them, while the longer routes begin to evaporate and are ignored. It's the same technique leafcutter ants use to establish the quickest routes to a food source. The digital ants quickly and efficiently identify the better options. And Air Liquide gets a highly efficient way to run its complex operations. But solving complex delivery problems is just the beginning of what ant colony optimizations can do. Their ability to identify the best route from billions of possibilities is now helping scientists reach far more ambitious destinations. Dr. Max Fasil from the University of Strathclyde in the UK has applied lessons from the ant colony to the problem of space travel. We uh, try to use ant colonies also to um, define the best way to go from one planet to another, passing by a number of intermediate planets and exploiting their gravity to uh, change the velocity of the satellite. If you send a spacecraft through the gravitational field of a planet at precisely the right angle, it acts like a catapult, propelling the spacecraft across the solar system. This is called a slingshot. By using more than one planet, it's possible to slingshot through space without the need for tons of fuel. But because the planets are constantly moving, Calculating the best combination of slingshots is extremely complicated. The interesting thing is that ants can really help you to define the best 
sequence of planets and the best way to reach the destination. If you uh, think of the traveling salesman problem, is like a traveling salesman problem, but the cities are moving. Max has tested his galactic version of ant colony optimization on the Cassini probe. Launched in 1997, it flew to Saturn, propelled there by slingshots past Venus, the Earth and Jupiter. The digital ants not only replicated this route, but also suggested two others that would have been quicker and more efficient. It's literally millions of miles away from leaf cutting. It has revealed the sheer scale of their organizational powers. In the same way that you couldn't really understand me by looking at in my individual cells, you couldn't understand an ant colony by simply knowing what one individual ant does. The, the ant colony is really a superorganism. Seen as a superorganism, the ant colony is one of the most impressive achievements in the evolution of life on our planet. And the more we come to understand it, the more we can harness the genius of the ants for our own benefit. We're only at the beginning of what ants can teach us.